Okay, well, I think I think we should go ahead and start. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you all for coming. Um, my name is Nick Hurlbert, and I'm the Director of Engineering for the ASALO project at Tech Matters. Um, Tech Matters is a nonprofit organization. Um, and I'm going to be talking about building customizable, scalable software as a service platforms for an entire social service field. But first, I'm going to talk about bees. Um, so friends of mine are beekeepers and they make and sell honey, beeswax candles, lip balm, lots of other bee and honey related products. And they're doing a pretty good business locally. They have a store, they go to, um, to the farmer's markets and festivals and um, have, have a great setup and do well. Um, but they want to take their shop online. They want to be able to sell their products on the internet as well. And so they're trying to figure out how to do that. And you know, we're all technologists here. So let's look at some of the different options that they have um, for potentially doing that. Um, one is they could hire, hire their own technical employees. So they could hire engineers and product managers and designers and, and manage that team themselves and build out their own platform. Or if they didn't want to have long-term employees, they could hire consultants to build something for them and then deliver it. And then they would, they would maintain that going forward. Um, another thing that they could do is just try to find a volunteer, find some software engineer who has some free time and can throw something together. Or they should just, they could just do it all themselves and they could um, just roll up their sleeves and learn to code and watch a YouTube video or buy a book or something like that. Um, so just think like, you know, what are, are, are there some good options here? Are there some things that they could do? Well, I would say um, no. All of these options are vastly expensive in time and money, and they take them away from, from their core strengths. Um, this is any, any of the things that they do here are just like a big distraction and are going to be really difficult for them. There are other options. There are um, software as a service platforms that exist to do precisely this, to help sort of small businesses um, sell their products online. And they cost something, but the cost of, of going with one of the platforms that's here versus many of the, many of the others that are available is, um, is just very different. So there, and these platforms have technical expertise and they, they can also share the, the new features and maintenance and all of those things. They spread that across thousands or millions of customers who are all benefiting from, from these platforms. So the, the market has, has solved this, has this problem. There are, there are several high quality competitors in the space. Um, and you know, our friends don't need to go off and, and do any of these other crazy options. They can, they can use one of the platforms that's available. So now what about nonprofits? What can nonprofits, social good organizations, um, what are the options that they have for the technology that they need? And specifically, I'm gonna talk about um, child helplines. Um, Asalo started out um, working in working in connection with child helpline, so I'm gonna I'm gonna focus on them. And there's about 160 of these helplines worldwide. They're in about 140 different countries, um, and they focus on helping children in crisis. Um, they provided need they provide needed services in uh, mental health counseling, um, either preventing or dealing with the effects of abuse. Um, in some cases, they're actually dealing with um, criminal cases. And in many countries, they end up being a core part of the child protection backbone of the country. Um, they also often have terrible technology. Um, they need to have a software platform where they can manage calls and messages. They can track contacts and cases over time. Um, and they often end up with bad options. Um, with better technology, they could work more efficiently, but as it is given the technology they have, they have about 30% of calls go unanswered due to lack of resources. Um, and having, um, having more efficient and better technology could help them help more kids and help them well. 
And all of the same bad options that I mentioned in terms of getting our, our beekeeper friends online um, also shows up with helplines. So um, helplines can build their own technical teams. And there are a couple of stories where that has actually worked well, very well. But generally speaking, when, when an organization that is not meant to be a tech organization tries to do this, it, it ends up being very difficult. Um, some of them have hired consultants and consultants have given them a platform that then they have to pay extra every time they want to add a new feature or maintain, maintain something. Um, some of them have even found volunteers. There's one case of the helpline that had a volunteer building their software platform for them. The volunteer then got a job and didn't have time anymore to keep, uh, to keep supporting that platform. And so they ended up with this sort of half done platform. Um, in some helplines, their, their people will try to get more technical, which is, which is great, um, but they still, trying to do themselves, they still generally leave a big gap um, in the technical know-how that's needed. Um, a third thing, or a fifth thing that I'll add to this that, that we've also seen is um, trying to shoehorn in like a corporate call center software, um, which ends up being really difficult. It doesn't really fit with their mission or their budget, and they're kind of using a system that doesn't fit and doesn't really work for them. So this is where Asalo comes in. Asalo is an open source software as a service contact center platform that is built for the needs of crisis helplines. Um, we have been building Asalo in partnership with child helplines, um, though it's really designed to work with any, cri any crisis helpline. Um, we use a software as a service model designed to be a single product that is customizable to local needs. Asalo is now live with six different helplines in six different countries. And there's many more who are signing up or in, and in the pipeline to come on board. So using our, using our experience with the Salo, I wanted to talk about um, key aspects of building a customizable, scalable software as a service platform for an entire social field. Um, and the key things here are partnership, um, designing for scalability, and thinking about long-term sector system change. Um, but before I cover those in detail, I wanted to um, quickly touch on the Acelo interface so that you just get kind of an idea about, about what it is. So this is what you're looking at here is the, um, the main counselor UI. So this is something that when uh, a helpline counselor is logged in, this is what they'll, what they'll see. And um, we support a number of different a number of different platforms or a number of different um, ways to contact helplines. So um, voice calls, SMS messages, um, Facebook Messenger, WhatsApp, web chat, Twitter direct messages, Instagram direct messages. Um, all of those are available and they come into the same place. So the example here is a Facebook Messenger message someone has written in. And one of the things we support is a, a chat bot, and this is all optionally configured, um, where the, there's some basic demographic information that's collected in the chat before the counselor even comes on, and then that information gets populated in these forms over here. Um, and so on the right side here, we have these data entry forms. And one big part of Asalo is that um, many of the things here are customizable. So, some helplines are completely anonymous. They don't want any information. They just, they just want to talk and help and one call only. Um, some helplines actually do a lot of follow-up and a lot of casework. And so they need to then collect a whole bunch of information. And so that's an example that you're seeing here. Um, but these are all customizable and they don't require any, any code changes to make that work. Um, so this is one form that has a child info. Um, then moving on a tab, there's um, categories. And this is important, especially when it comes to reporting on what's going on and having a sense of um, what are the issues that are arising. Um, and we'll get more into this um, later on talking about reporting. Um, but this is another aspect where they can label a cat and they can categorize contacts as they're coming in. Another thing that we support is um, case management. So you also have the option to create a case, which is more of a long running thing that, that counselors can go back to 
And this especially often arises if there's some sort of criminal thing or something more chronic and more difficult to deal with over time. Um, so with a case, open a case, you have a timeline that can include um, contacts and notes and other things that the counselors are leaving as they're working on it. Um, there's information on, on follow-up dates and what the status of the case is, as well as some more detailed information, um, incidents that happen if there is some sort of a, a crime or something like that. So there's a lot of different ways they can record. Um, and this is also, also customizable. The final thing I'll mention looking at the Acelo interface is um, reporting. So you can do reporting on um, how many contacts are coming through to, at a given time, or how long is it taking counselors to answer calls, and those sorts of things that are available. There's also higher level aggregation, and I showed the, the contacts or the categories earlier, and this is where you can get a sense they can look at kind of what categories are coming through and see that you know, there's a certain, certain categories. And um, for example, in, these, in the category of violence, the, there's 92% bullying is just one example. So having, having gone over that and given a feel for a CELO, um, I'll get back to um, some of these key aspects. And um, the first one is partnership. So a CELO was really born out of a comp out of a conversation between um, our team and uh, Child Helpline International, which is sort of the, the, the network organization, the affiliate organization that all of these child helplines are part of. And they saw a need for, um, for better technology. And we talked with dozens of different helplines to ask them, what was their current technology? How is it failing them? What would they want to see? What would they need? Um, and out of those conversations, we got a much better idea of what needed to be done. We then, following on from those conversations, had um, 10 different helplines that were sort of our beta testers and were part of a specific program with us. And this was uh, 10 helplines from, from all around the world. They were a diverse group that was representative of the needs that, that helplines would have. Um, and we would release software every sort of four to six weeks, ask them to provide feedback, ask them if it fits what they need and adjust it if it wasn't, and then ask them what else do you need? What are, what are the next priorities? And over a process of that, we ended up building a, a product that really fit the needs of, of what they were looking for. Now that we have helplines that are actively using the platform every day in production, um, we're also spending time looking at what their needs are and how we can best serve them um, as we continue to move forward and really focus on being, being in partnership and creating this together. Um, another aspect of partnership is cost solidarity. So um, technology is expensive. And in order to have something be a long-term solution, it needs to be financially sustainable. Um, our goal, we are a nonprofit organization and our goal is impact. Our goal is not profit. Um, and so we're working with helplines to find ways where we can have this be sustainable and also give everyone access to it who needs it. Um, one of the ways that this works out is a sliding scale of cost based on um, helplines, sort of more wealthy world helplines might end up um, paying more, though still less than what they would pay for like more of a corporate solution. Um, and then more developing world helplines that are often very squeezed with budget would end up paying less. Um, we also work with, with helplines on shared fundraising um, when that's appropriate. So trying to find ways to, to make sure that everyone can get access to good technology. Um, and then another aspect of partnership is um, joint efforts. So um, for example, working with a number of helplines regionally on um, fighting child sexual uh, exploitation online, um, or working with a number of countries in a, in a region where there's a refugee crisis, where they are all affected and they can all kind of band together to help out. And doing that builds these partnerships, both leverages the collaboration that we have and also further improves this. Um, and we're working all on a, on a shared mission. Um, another big aspect of doing this is scalability by design. So 
um, we, knowing that we were expecting to eventually have hundreds, if not thousands of helplines on this platform, we designed it differently. We designed it for that. So one thing is relying on um, good cloud infrastructure underneath. So we use, um, we use Twilio and AWS as platforms underneath. Um, parts of that interface that I showed before have are actually coming directly from Twilio in terms of providing some of the underlying uh, telecommunications. Um, and building on those platforms means that there's a lot of stuff that we don't have to worry about. And as a silo grows, there's a lot of ways to build in the, the underlying scalability. So, so doing those sorts of things doesn't have to be those platforms specifically, there are many others, um, but finding underlying platforms is really helpful. Um, also customizability. Um, having talked with a number of different helplines, we already knew that they had a variety of things that they, that they needed. So we designed for flexibility from the beginning in ways that we knew we would need to. So um, support for multiple languages. When we came to add our first non-English user interface, um, we had already planned for that. And so that was relatively easy. Um, another thing was knowing that these data entry forms that I showed earlier, everyone's going to want different ones. So we planned that in a way that we didn't have to like write different code in order to support that. And then as new, new helplines have new needs and we discover that there are things that we actually want to be customizable for them, we can tweak that going forward. Um, another big thing is automation. So we use a lot of automated scripts for deployment or for setting up new helplines. We use infrastructure as code tools um, to, to set up new infrastructure. Um, that is necessary as we add more, we, we add more helplines on the system um, so that our operational, the operational costs that we have don't become overwhelming and our engineers are spending all of their time doing operational stuff. Um, this is really an essential thing to build in and to try to build in as, as soon as possible. And then the last thing is um, sector systems change. So thinking about big long-term impact, the, you know, the impact that we're looking for here is um, by 2025 to have helplines be able to answer three times as many contacts at roughly the same level of budget. So their people are more efficient, um, the process is more efficient, and it's still providing the same, the same care. And beyond that, the, just dealing with um, mental health and the needs of the needs of kids um, and needs of kids in specific crises. Um, also, the, the ability to do that is the systems change we're looking for. And that comes in a number of ways. One is um, shared data. And I mentioned appropriately shared data because um, there's a lot of sensitivity in Rightly Show around tech companies having data and what they do with it. Um, we, we say to helplines and our agreement we have with helplines is that they own their data and that they can choose to, to take it away if they want to. Um, we're not going to do anything nefarious with it and we're gonna have be transparent about how it's being used. Um, but having, having data being recorded in a similar way and in, this, in the shared platform means that that aggregated data reporting um, can be a lot easier and drive better outcomes and global advocacy. Um, these helplines are, child helplines are required once a year to share, to share aggregated data. And that's always a very onerous process. And so using a shared platform, using some of the reporting tools that I've shown, it makes it a lot easier for them to do that and they can, they can do more with it. Um, shared best practices. So this shows up in a couple of different ways. One is just the actual programmatic, how are they interacting with kids, what are they doing there? And that's not for us as the technologists to determine, that's really for the, the helpline movement to decide. Um, but we can build those things into the platform so that everyone can take advantage of that rather than people needing to do that one off. And um, another aspect of best practices is things like security and privacy. So we can build in strong security controls. Um, some of the helpline technology that we've seen has not been very secure, which is pretty concerning. Um, but there's, we're able to build in more of that and like drive best practices in those ways. Um, and then shared growth. So a helpline that, that works with um, a one-off consulting company will have to pay for every new feature and they only get the benefit of that. Um, by using a shared platform, 
new features can benefit everyone. Um, and it means that when there are emerging needs that sort of we as a, as a community can adapt to that more. So um, coming back to this, I think um, we found that uh, having software as a service platforms um, working together with a whole social sector um, can really provide the platform for shared success. And um, this shows up in a few different ways. This shows up in partnership in working together around a shared mission, um, building for scalability, um, as well as thinking about long-term impact and systems change. So um, that's, that's the end of uh, the slides. Um, this is my email address. Um, you're welcome to reach out. Uh, we also have the email address for um, the Acelo product overall, if you'd like to talk more about that and our website. And with that, I will look at some of the questions in either in the Slack channel from Good Tech Fest or in the in the answer in the, the Zoom chat here. Um, so, um, okay, so there's a question on uh, informed consent. So we, so we are working directly with, um, with the helplines. And so we make it clear to helplines, like what is being recorded? How does it work? Um, and uh, helplines are, there's, there's different informed consent requirements in different places and helplines kind of work out, work that out directly. We work that out with them. Um, one thing that can be done is like an automated message that goes out before there's a contact, before, before a counselor is talking with them. Um, one thing that I didn't show is the ability to do sort of a canned response so that a counselor, if there is a need to sort of make it clear to inform consent of a child that you're talking with, um, that blurb can come out. Um, so that's something that um, the helplines are sort of figuring out in terms of how they want to reach the kids, but then we're working, we're working with the helplines to support that. Um, data protection and security, we do pretty much the standard, um, standard things. Our staff are all using uh, multi-factor authentication. Um, uh, everything is encrypted. Everything is pretty locked down. Um, we also uh, we have a security overview that we share with helplines that shows what we're doing. We also encourage them to use best practices, encourage things like multi-factor authentication. Um, we also have basic things like network segmentation and things like that. Um, uh, multi-tenancy. So it's designed to be, it's designed to operate as multi-tenant. Um, we have we have a multi-tenant system there. It's all based on separate account IDs so that um, a helpline using a system with one account ID and one set of permissions can't access anybody else's data. Um, we, we are working on rolling out into actually doing separate regions where we have separate tenants. Um, really the system can operate both as multi-tenant as, as, and as single tenant. Um, we generally do a multi-tenant thing. Um, uh, referral information in the system. Um, we have currently a, uh, a very simple referral thing where we can, where helplines can have a drop down and say that we're referring to someone, um, which allows a way to record that. Um, it's, that's a bit minimal, but, uh, doing more of a referral and resource database is something that we're actually working on this year and, and we'll be rolling out. Um, yes, the source, um, the source on GitHub is available. Um, if you go to the tech matters, I can actually type this in the tech matters, GitHub organization. There's actually a bunch of stuff in there. Um, uh, Flex plugins. Uh, we, we are using Twilio Flex as, as the underlying provider for, 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 some, for some of the system and, and mainly for the, for the front end. Um, there is a Flex plugins repo that has the Flex plugin that, that we use. Um, 
And yeah, we've found that, you know, the adaptability of Flex um, has been pretty good for being able to build um, to build for a helpline use case. Um, oh, I'm, I actually, um, that last message that I typed was for, um, ended up going to a specific person. So um, thank you very much. Uh, feel free to reach out either in the uh, Good Tech Fest Slack channel um, or in or by email. Um, really thank you all for coming. And um, I think we can wrap up. So thank you very much. <laughs>